So everything I'm gonna tell you, I'm sure you heard before, but everything is amplified. All of these things we talked about take on a different meaning. So I have about 10 different areas and we're gonna go through two or three at a time and then I'll pause, but this is just good professional advice for everybody. So first, uh, if, it, uh, if it doesn't kill you, it'll make you stronger. So just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, in the midst of crisis opportunity, you know that. So I think the first thing is to reflect upon is the spiritual part of things. This is, a, this is a perfect time to ask the question, why am I here? Why am I here on this earth, planet earth? Is this here to just consume and acquire? Or is there something more, the reason to survive, it's really to exist? And I don't think it, you have to save the world. It could be just as well that, you know, just, just uh, everybody has it. I'm sure everybody in this call has that in their heart. But still ask the question to reinforce that saying, you know, I exist to take care of my elderly grandmother. Or I really want to, you know, it's about the family. Or I want to help one person. In fact, uh, uh, let me share a story that really always speaks to me. And some of you have heard it. It's about the a little boy uh, standing at the beach. And a man is walking towards the boy. And he sees that the boy bends down, picks up something from the beach, and throws it into the ocean. One more, pick it up, throw it to the ocean. As the man got uh, closer, he noticed that there's tens of thousands of starfish that have been beached. And the boy is picking one at a time and throwing them into the ocean. So the man told the boy, he said, look, there's so many of them. What difference are you gonna make? And the boy picked up a starfish, threw it in the ocean and said, look, I made a difference for that one. To me, that's purpose, you know, that, 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 so, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time, but do ask this question because you know, we have all sort of anxieties. Purpose gives you a reason to live. And like I said earlier about the ring, this too shall pass. But you're going to become stronger if you re reunite with your purpose. I mean, a good example, you look at the healthcare profession I picked up from my friends in India. You know, in some ways, challenging religion. This is the most popular course on EBX. And if you want the summary, here it is. What happiness really means and why it matters to you. Foster happiness in others, social connections, kindness, community, free course folks, you know, go for it. Here's the other thing I've done that helped me a lot. You know, we are bombarded with information. Every conversation starts with pandemic and numbers and all that. I have decided I have half hour of worry window every day. I think the world's gonna go on just fine. The pandemic's gonna go on fine without me. I don't need to notice. Stay healthy. Don't fall for COVID-15. So here's a good one. Now you are a television broadcaster or a movie star, really. Even if, you know, while you're casual and you're working from a backyard and you have these cute images in the background, dress for success. I, I don't mean physically dress, but is your brand appearance online conducive to what you do? So first of all, let me just get throw my bias. I know a lot of people I've seen on the screens, they have, uh, you know, their avatars or cutesy uh, backgrounds. By the way, backgrounds are passe now. I mean, they were popular because of a few things, a little technological gimmick. Backgrounds are distorted. I mean, they're very distracting. Because background is image processing. They're taking your image and putting a, it's like a green screen stuff. But the problem is that you see their hairs blowing away and they have a hole in the ear and they, you know, their, their right shoulder disappeared. If, if, if I'm seeing my doctor online, do I want to see Golden Gate Bridge? No, I, I want to see their office. You know, I want to see like looks like it, is, it should instill some confidence. And, and similarly, the other thing I'm noticing is that what happens is that uh, when we are in online meetings, 
people become very pensive. They sort of fall into line the hierarchy. Everybody's on audio mute or the moderator has the audio mute. So there's no engagement. This is an opportunity to excel. Hey, pick up a bring interesting, positive, upbeat item and just kind of throw it out there for people to cheer on. I mean, I've been trying some of my meetings myself, and it's just you know, find a little humor or something and create some engagement, you know, just like it used to be in personal meetings. So these are opportunities. Stop multitasking. If if you're attending a meeting, bring value. And by values, that means stop multitasking. And also, of course, uh, the medium definitely asks for brevity. Uh, in fact, this is a, one of my uh, very successful team members. I, you know, the problem is that uh, because of the, especially desktops and laptops, you know, you never see you're looking at each other. Uh, now, Umer here, he has his iPhone on one side of the monitor. And so it's a very, very good pose. And iPhones have, or iPhones or mobile phones of all kinds have wonderful cameras, good audio quality. And so, so you, without even have to worry about that, I've been trying to get in my office, so I have a little bit better background, like bookshelf and all that. I just haven't gone around to it. But really, uh, you know, subliminally, otherwise, subconsciously, you build trust. I mean, look at the two images, you know. So, so that's the sort of uh, age old thing. That what, what's your brand image? Uh, let me do this. Before I get to that, we covered three of our topics, and we're doing just fine on time. Uh, uh, take a couple of questions if you have any, you know, any of these topics we've talked about so far. Michael, any, any thoughts? I, I know I, I sort of surprised everybody by pausing for questions, but I thought oh, let's sorry, I'm off. I'm off mute. Thanks, PK. Uh, uh, we do. We have a question from uh, Isabella Mann. She's asking uh, really about uh, employers and exploitation. Uh, she, she, she asks if, if you anticipate that employers will exploit new or recent graduates, knowing that many job seekers have limited options uh, and they're desperate for work. And what should we do about this? You know, I can talk about Silicon Valley because I do know a lot of people here. I work with a lot of employers. It depends on the company. There are companies that are basically very socially conscious. They have a social compact. They have pay scales. Or like, you know, just look at uh, our my esteemed institution, USKSA. I mean, you know, we don't. But on the other hand, there are companies, uh, they could be in financial trouble. And uh, so the answer is yes and no. I mean, it depends on the company. But I would say by and large, uh, most major employers are not looking to, I mean, they have ranges clearly, and they might go slightly lower. But I think exploitation means that, well, you know, you don't have a job, and the outlook is not so good. We'll give you half of what you really deserve. I don't think so. I mean, by and large, uh, I think despite of what Silicon Valley is framed at, I think the social ethos is pretty good around here. And so by, you know, by and large. Uh, one more question before we move on. Yes. Uh, as the job market, is this, by the way, is, uh, Oh gosh, I don't have the I don't have the source. I'm sorry. As the job market is shifting, and experienced, aged professionals would lose their source of income, could experts and consultants survive in this new economic shift? Yes, and the reason for that is that uh, there's going to be a general reluctance to hire long-term full-time employees. General reluctance. I mean, obviously, depending on the company. So in times like these, they tend to be that they would rather pay a slightly higher wage, but not have the permanent relationship. And really, it's a slightly cost reduction strategy because by the time you had overhead, healthcare, and retirements, and everything, the costs go up. So there's going to be much more of the shorter term uh, tenure. In fact, I'm counseling several students, and I'm suggesting that uh, they have some experience that uh, start to market yourself for short term gigs, you know, three months, six months. Uh, there are much more of those already, by the way, that are happening. Okay, so we're going to move on to the adding value. Now, this is a very important attitude thing. And, and I know I feel a little bit preachy here, but, you know, I find successful people have one trait that no matter where they are, they are adding value. But let me just challenge you to ask the question that we are together here. Doesn't matter whether I'm talking or somebody else is talking, you're part of this community that's here for until eight o'clock. Are you adding value? It's a mindset. I'll tell you a story that changed my life. And this is an old IBM story, but this woman went to IBM exec and said, I really want to work for IBM. 
I know, I know it's going to be an old story if you say I really want to work for IBM, uh, but hey, it's still a good company, though, by the way. I, I, I like the company a lot. Uh, <clears throat> and he, he said, he asked her why. She said, well, I work in the shoe business. Shoe business is boring. IBM is a great company. It's a fun company. And I hate, I hate the people I work with. And you know what his answer was? No business is boring. People are boring. People take the boredom from job to job and drag down everybody else around them. So he advisors to go back and find the excitement of the job, find some challenges. She came back and she said, you know what, I love what I do. To me, that's the example of adding value. Uh, if I indulge you, you know, it becomes an attitude. It, it becomes the way you think about things. So, and I, I, I know one of my favorite stories about a, a monastery and a monk. And the rule of the monastery was that uh, you can only say two words every 10 years. So a young monk comes into the monastery, uh, they shave his head, give him the blanket, say, hey, there's your room, go prosper. 10 years go by, the head monk called the junior monk and said, you got two words. He said, you know, bed, hard, bed, sleeping bed, hard. The monk said, okay, thank you. Another 10 years go by, the monk is getting middle-aged, comes back to the head monk, said two words. He said, food, bad, food is bad, food, bad. He said, okay, thank you. Another 10 years go by, the monk's looking 50 something and all that. Uh, the head monk calls him and says two words. He said, what? He said, I quit. The head monk says, look, you might as well, all you do is bitch, bitch, bitch. So think about it for a moment, you know. You may have done the most fantastic job, but, but it, even simple things, so be on the A game requires to have that attitude that no matter what you are, adding value. And a, and a side to sort of a note to this thing is that there's lots of books out there, but I'm constantly asking this question of myself. What is my likability index? When I come across people, when I talk to them for the first time, second time, do they like me? And liking is not about being clever. Liking is not about being knowledgeable. Liking is not about any of those things you think, not impressing people or how big shot you are, liking is about listening, liking or caring, liking or remembering. So fundamental human skills, but these all add value. I think in terms of, uh, we talked about uh, being a private consultant or subject matter expert. Uh, since I spent five years in the global entrepreneurship scheme, this business is going to explode. There's so many new problems to be solved. And what better place to do this than Silicon Valley? So if, if, if you have a, one third of our audience does not have a job, there's plenty of free resources. Uh, you can go to NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center in uh, San Francisco. You can go to my other organization, Thai. Lots of free education. You know, there's tons and tons of free resources. Take an online course on entrepreneurship. There's plenty of people, if you have smart ideas, to give you seed money of first $50,000 to start. Get started. And in fact, if anything, I can tell you globally, I've been talking to people in other countries, corporate sector, the Fortune 500 and the equivalent is not the one who can create the jobs. Everybody is realizing this is the salvation. This is the way progressive states, uh, you know, central governments that have to deal with promoting entrepreneurship. So this is again a great, here's a good example I found over the weekend. Many of you are looking, so somebody said, you know what, there's a lot of barbers who are not on hairstylists who are not working. Why don't we connect online with people who need a haircut? Talk about digitization. You know, and obviously this means your friend or your spouse or your kid, somebody is there, but it's, it's, it's doing very well. It's doing fantastically well. It's an example of, you know, why wait for uh, uh, entrepreneurship really that simple. If you're sensing there's a problem out there, you're feeling, find a clever solution, find a way to monetize. Uh, close to my heart, lifelong learning. I cannot tell you, it's not a business thing, but uh, the world's gonna change. Ask the question, is my job predictable and repeatable? If it is, it's better do something about upskilling yourself. And, and I think this thing's gonna go on. So unless you're 50 something and retiring in two or three years and you have a secure job, 
Yes, but otherwise, come see us as you see us the extension. We're in Silicon Valley, high quality, reasonable prices. I think this also managing upwards or managing your boss takes on a new dimension. Because it used to be that you surrender to your boss in the hallway. Now everything is a half hour Zoom meeting. So you have to take the responsibility of uh, the person who's going to promote you, the person who's going to look after you. You have to remind them the world has become remote and to some extent out of sight, out of mind. So I think try to find your creative ways to. See, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you stuff, I, I suspect you've heard this before, but these things in the, in the remote world, they take on a new dimension. I think I talked a little bit about this, words matter, but this is from the music, Silver, in the, the band Civil War, your mouth is poison, your mouth is wine. I, I live and die by this quote. I think it goes back to the Chinese philosopher, Lao Tzu, Words, words become actions, action becomes habits, habits become character, character become your destiny. Now, let me say this, that you can control, you cannot control your thoughts. I don't think anybody is, most people are, but you can certainly control your words. Okay, enough of that. I feel like a preacher here now on the Sunday, Sunday morning, so I'll get past this thing. Uh, this is another thing that's gonna happen as the part of the new world that you're moving into, uh, is that there's gonna be a lot of ambiguity. The historic vertical thinking where there's a problem, there's a solution A, B, C, you pick the best solution. Very, very strict, you know, analytical. A lot of problems don't have a solution. You're gonna have to just be saying, let's just play the game. If I indulge you in another small vignette, uh, this is from another pandemic uh, about the time we talked about the Black Plague. Uh, there was a farmer and he did sharecropping you know, three bad years uh, <clears throat> went broke. The landlord said, we're going to throw you out. But he said, look, you know, I'll give you a deal. You have a beautiful young daughter and the lecturer's old landlord said, if I marry her, then your family and you'll forgive the debt. And uh, so the father looked sort of worried. The daughter said, uh, what's the problem, dad? And talked about, he said, let me go see him, you know. Ambiguity, I don't know, but let's play the game. So he goes to the landowner. The landowner says, uh, you know, yeah, here's the proposition. She said, well, you know, this is not fair, blah, blah, blah. Can we, you know, so he said, okay, let's play a game. I see that big pile of pebbles. We'll pick two pebbles and we'll pick a red one. I mean, we'll pick a black one and a white one and put them in this pouch, the leather pouch. And you pick one. And if you, uh, you know, pick the white pebble, then tell you what, we'll forgive the debt, you know, it's like a game, uh, you know, you go, life goes on. Now, on the other hand, if you pick a black pebble, you know, you uh, you marry me and if it's still fine. She said, well, if I don't play the game, he said, well, then we throw you out. <laughs> so if a vertical thinker would say, well, probability of X, probability of Y, you know, blah, 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 you know, I'm sunk either way, I'm screwed. She said, look, I'm a lateral thinker, you know, Let's play the game. So they walk up to the pebble and she noticed that he actually picked two black pebbles. And now the vertical thinker would say, oh, I'm really screwed now. So she picked one and kept fumbling, making small talk and drops the pebble. And she says, look, oops, I dropped this one, but let's look in the pouch, whatever you have, I must have had the other one. See, that's, that's an example of, you know, sometimes in this crazy world of ambiguity, Play the game, be creative, be, be nimble. Perfect is an enemy of the good. You know, I manage very, very large organizations and I always felt that if I once get something done, I always ask the person who I know is super busy. Unless you're writing software code, 99% is good enough. And all of us know with all the knowledge resources, all the tools are available, you can get a lot of stuff done. In fact, I did a very, very interesting experiment uh, when I was working for the governor in California. You know, you get a request from time to time of saying this needs to be done by Monday or Friday afternoon, they're telling you. 
end up with that. One said, well, you know, I need to know more. I need to do project plan. Yeah, I think I can, I, I, and I didn't tell him what, how the priority is. So, you know, two or three months. And uh, the second one said, well, I know you have this deadline. Let me see what I can get you by Monday morning. But then you need, if it's not the right thing. The third one, the super busy guy, he said, you know what? I think I get it. Give me half an hour. Let me just do some bullet points. Let me come back and, and see if that sort of makes sense, you know, uh, and see if we're on the right track and we get it done. You know, same problem, three different attitudes. And it's not about that they're, they're not skilled or qualified, but I often say, you got all the resources of the world, the internet, you got a bottle of wine or a glass of wine, you can do a lot of stuff done. In a, but the idea is that we all tend to strive for perfection. We have the standard. But this is a way of doing a lot of stuff frequently, you know, keep the cycling. And <clears throat> I do this, especially in these days. Every day, it's scheduled something that's actually fun. Having a video chat with the phone because it gets you out of that funk. So we've talked about the state of the economy. We've given you a shape of the future. And I hope these tips, while they might something you heard in the remote world, these things are getting amplified. But let me repeat. 90% of the people, I made this number up, but 90% of the people, when there's a big disruption or a crisis, they freeze. They hunker down and just kind of wait for the storms to go away and things get tidy and real again. This is a time to bring your A game. It doesn't take a whole lot to get the A game because everybody else is frozen. 